It's my privilege and pleasure to read to you this morning from the living word of God. It comes from John, the seventh chapter. Uh, If you have your books with you, I encourage you to open them there. Otherwise, the words will be on the screen. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up till that time, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man is a prophet. Others said he is the Messiah. Still others asked. How can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and said to the Pharisees who asked them, Why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards replied. You mean he was deceived by you? You, He has deceived you also? The Pharisees retorted. Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? No. But this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus early and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he's been doing? They replied, Are you a a Galilean too? Look into it, and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. May God add his blessing on our reading, our pursuit to understand, and our seeking to live these words out in our lives. Let us pray. God, as Pastor Keith comes forward to preach your everlasting gospel, we ask that you might embolden him, that you might strengthen him, that you might guide him in this task, that you might give him uh, perfect health in spirit and mind so that he might speak your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Awesome. Can you hear me okay? We getting there? It'll happen, I promise. I'll do some shouting if I have to in here today. Um, But it's good to be with you. I I love um, John's Gospel. He tells us in... In the beginning and in the end of his gospel that he's writing the things he's writing for a very specific purpose. And and that purpose is that we might believe in Jesus, that he is the the Messiah and have life in his name. He, He also tells us that if everything that were written about Jesus that could have been written about Jesus... Uh, that the world could not contain all of the books that were out there. So there's clearly uh, many, many things that could have been written and were written about Jesus, more than, than we see in John's Gospel. But John picks and chooses the things about his Gospel that he wants us to hear and understand for a very specific reason, so that we can, can have this belief in him. And as we've been journeying through John's Gospel, we, we've seen Jesus saying and doing some pretty amazing things, haven't we? We've seen him do some of these things and say some of these things in secret conversations uh, and and, and one-on-one interactions with people, as well as, you know, in a little bit more public settings. And where we find ourselves today at this great feast, the latest, the last and greatest day of the feast, according to to this text, um, we see Jesus standing and doing something in a very public way. And I want us to understand what's going on here in this text so that we can understand Jesus' comments in context. Because, you know, sometimes our our, our understanding of, of what Jesus says isn't quite full if we don't understand where he is and what he's doing, the context of it. So let's talk about this feast of, of boots that we that we read about and what's going on at this last day. Remember, Jesus' brothers had said, are you going up to the feast? Go up there and tell everybody where you are. Because this feast uh, was a place where the, the entire Jewish community would gather. Hundreds of thousands of people in Jerusalem every year would gather to celebrate uh, what they call the Feast of Booths. And what that means is this. Uh, 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 the Feast of Booths 
was a seven or eight day feast that commemorated the way that the Israelites lived when they went out of Egypt into the desert. Because they, they were they were delivered from slavery and they cross the Red Sea and they wind up in the desert and they've got to live somewhere, right? I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of people and they don't have pop-up trailers. They don't have camping packs. They don't have hotels. They're basically wandering around and there's there's all types of, diff- of people. There's there's young children. There's babies. There's old men and old women. There's there's everyone. So how do you take care of a group that big? Where does everybody live? Where does everybody sleep? So God gave them these instructions to build like these little shelters, and they called them they called them booths. And this is how the people lived uh, for forty years. And and. Every year they would gather together and have this feast and, and remember what God had done for them and how they lived. Well, every day in the feast, there would be a moment when the priest would take some water out of the pool of Siloam and go before the altar of God in the temple and place the, the pool of water, the, the, the bowl of water at the pool to commemorate how God provided water for his people in the desert. And on the last and greatest day of the feast, there would be even more, the portion of water they would use would be increased greatly to commemorate how this happened. There's a story of that in in the, the book of Exodus chapter 17 about how God provided water for his children in the desert. And this will be familiar to some of you, but for some of you, this might be the first time you've heard this story. So I'll read to you some of these verses from Exodus chapter 17. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Now, remember, there's a lot of parallels between what Jesus is talking about in John chapter 5 and 6 and what happened here. Remember how Jesus says to the people, why do you grumble against me? They were grumbling when Jesus talked about, about this and, and he's pointing backwards to this, this encounter here in Exodus 17. So the people are upset with Moses. They're saying, where's the water? We're going to die. Why did you do this to us? Then Moses, the Lord answered Moses. Oh, Moses cried out to the Lord in verse 4. What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. You remember that staff, right? It was the staff that, that, that Moses went before Pharaoh with and said, Thus saith the Lord, and it turned into a snake, and then he picked it up. That's very staff. The Lord says, Go. And here's what he says to do here. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? So this entire thing that was happening in John chapter 7 is pointing back to this experience that took place in the desert where the Jewish people had grumbled against Moses and the Lord said, we're thirsty, give us water to drink. So Moses takes that staff and strikes it against the rock and from that stricken rock, water flows. Water flows. It's within this context, it's within this feast, this celebration that Jesus stands up in a public place, in a loud voice, cries out to the people. And he says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Can you imagine what that must have been like? I mean, Jesus basically interrupted the entire holy process here 
where everyone's focused on this water and these priests. And Jesus stands up and says, look, if you're thirsty, come to me and I will give you this living water. And up from within that person who comes to me, streams of living water will flow. How scandalous for Jesus to do this. Remember, his brothers had said to him, go up and tell everyone who you are. Do a trick, Jesus. Well, Jesus doesn't do a trick, does he? He stands up and he says, everything that you're celebrating here, everything that you're commemorating here has pointed to me, Jesus said. Remember, he had he had been doing this for a while now. He'd been pointing to himself as this living bread, because in the same way that God provided water for the Jews, he also provided food in the form of this manna from heaven. And as Jesus would speak, the Jews would say to him, hey, well, what are you going to do for us? Our forefathers ate manna in the desert. God gave them this special bread. What are you going to give to us? And Jesus said, I am the bread that has come from heaven. Your forefathers ate that manna and they died. But whoever eats of my flesh and drinks of my blood will have life. Remember all of these things we've been reading in John chapter 6. And it all leads to this public moment where Jesus interrupts the feast and publicly declares that the answer to humanity's thirst is found in Him. It makes a lot more sense, doesn't it, when you understand the backstory, when you see the picture of what was really going on, the whole picture. This doesn't make people happy, though, does it? You see... There's a lot of reactions here to what Jesus is saying. And I want to point out what the people said. Because everyone looked at this and thought, what's going on here? What is he saying? And here's what he's saying. Number one, that he is the fulfillment of God's provision for humanity. He's saying, look, I'm the food and I'm the drink. There was no basic more basic elements to human survival than water and bread. And Jesus had now stood before the people and said, look, I am, I've come from God. If you come to me, you will never be hungry. You will never be thirsty. Of course, he wasn't speaking of of, of physical hunger and thirst. He was speaking of that hunger and thirst that goes so much deeper, that hunger and thirst from our souls. And he was saying, look, everything that that happened in, in, in the Israelites' journey out of the desert has pointed, was a foreshadowing to me. And in the same way that 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 rock was struck and streams of life would flow, the church would later recognize that's a foreshadowing of Jesus, that he's the rock on which our faith is founded. And and as he was struck, that water came from him. Literally and spiritually. He's the fulfillment of God's provision for humanity. And He alone can satisfy our thirst. Secondly, He's saying this, that He has come from God in a way that no one else has. Sure, there had been prophets. There had been, you know, men and women who had visions from God and and opportunities to, to shepherd the the, the flock of God, the nation of Israel, but Jesus is saying things that no one else had said. He's making claims in a way that, that no one else had who could actually back it up. He's not saying, thus saith the Lord, repent, turn to God. He's saying, repent, turn to me. He's identifying himself as God. He's saying that from within him lies the answer to humanity's thirst. And thirdly, he points out that his words are not of human origin because they bring spiritual life. If you remember from Pastor Mike's sermon last week, that Jesus talked about his own words and he said, look, you could, you know, I'm not just making this stuff up, people. I didn't just create this one day in my, in my room. I, I, I've come from God. The words that I speak, they don't come from any person. They come from God above. He speaks the words of God. This is what Jesus is saying when he stands up in this feast. He's saying all of your religious ritual practices and all of the things that have happened have led to me. So come to me. And living water will come from your heart. 
as the Spirit would be given. Now, pretty controversial things that Jesus said. And he, he said many controversial things up to this point. And of course, the reactions in this crowd are a little bit different because not everyone that's in the crowd that he's speaking to in our text today was there when he talked about his bread and his, and his or the body and his blood. It's, these are people that have come from all over Israel to this feast. And of course, as you can imagine, there, there are mixed responses. And what we see in our scripture today is basically three of them. We see some of the people just full acceptance of Jesus, don't we? We see some people say, oh, he is a prophet. You know, he, he's, he's, he could even be the Messiah. You know, th- this is incredible. Listen to the way he speaks. Listen to, to what he's saying. Look at what he's doing. He, he's the Messiah. So the, there were many that, that at that moment put their faith in him and took him at his word. Well, of course, there were also those who rejected him. So rejection of Jesus was a response. There were some who, who ignorantly said, well, doesn't the scripture teach us that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem? Where was Jesus born? Right? He was born in Bethlehem, but not everybody knew that. Remember, this is 2,000 years ago. This is, this is before we have the Bible. This is be- the New Testament. This is before we have, you know, the Christmas story. This is before all of that. Not everybody knew everything about Jesus. And, and, and some couldn't understand where he could be from. So they're like, oh, well, well, this can't be the real deal. It can't be him. Forget about this. Let's just reject him. The, the, the chief priests and the, the Pharisees, they, they heard him and they were just offended that he would, he would interrupt their, their ceremony and bring the focus to himself. And they said, this is ridiculous. Arrest this man. Something must be done with him. And among that crowd of Pharisees was a man named Nicodemus. Now, if you remember from chapter 3, you remember Nicodemus, don't you? He was the Jewish leader that came to Jesus and asked him questions. And he stands up with a third response to Jesus. And here's what Nicodemus says. He says, hey, maybe we should listen to him before we judge him. Simple answer. Maybe before we arrest him and, and, and have him killed or do whatever we're going to do, maybe we should actually judge him only after we've listened to what he said and seen what he's done. Isn't that what our law says? Remember, Nicodemus was the man who came to Jesus in secret at night because he was afraid of what his buddies would think of him if they knew that he was talking to Jesus. And what did Jesus say? He said to him, you must be born of water and the Spirit to enter into the kingdom of heaven. He talked about the new birth. Water and the Spirit. Water and the Spirit. What is Jesus talking about here at this festival? Water and the Spirit. And something goes off in Nicodemus' brain. And he's like, oh my gosh. You guys, we better, we better think about this before we make up our minds about Jesus. We better listen to Him before we judge Him. It's great advice, isn't it? It's great advice. But I want you to look at what Nicodemus doesn't tell them to do. He says, definitely judge Jesus, right? We should judge Jesus, Nicodemus says. But only after they listened to his words and what he did. He, he didn't ask them to judge Jesus based on their feelings, right? He didn't say to, Nicod- to, to, the, to the Pharisees, well, I want you guys to really like sit down and, and ask yourselves, how does Jesus make you feel? What does he do for you? How, does, how do you emotionally respond to him? How does, how does he make you feel? How does what he says make you feel? And then, you know, just feel free to judge based on how you feel. He doesn't say that, does he? He, he doesn't ask them to judge based on what the culture said. Because the culture was all mixed up about who Jesus was. They didn't know. They were trying to figure out. He didn't say, well, let's take a poll and find out what's popular. You know, let's put a post up on Facebook and see what everybody comments and then we'll decide what we believe about Jesus. Right. Let's let's ask around. Let's let's have a panel discussion and figure out what what society and culture says about it. He, he doesn't do that. And he doesn't ask them 
to judge based on what their friends thought. He doesn't say, well, you know, get together with some of your friends and you guys kind of decide what you think and, and, you know, report back and then, you know, we'll judge Jesus based on that. He doesn't do that, does he? See, I think this is great advice. He, he, he tells them simply, look at what he says. Look at what he does. See, in today's culture, I would add to this, you know, but this is good advice. Look at the Scripture. Judge Jesus on that. You see, every one of us, listen to me, every one of us has to judge Jesus, don't we? Every one of us is put, Mike talked about that last week, we, we're put to Jesus with that question. Who is He? What are we going to do with Him? How will we respond to Him? All of us have to do that. The question is, on what basis do we? On what basis do we? talking to a pastor friend of mine the other day and we were having this conversation about some things going on in his church and and you know they were having a special meeting to talk about some issues and there was some disagreement in his church about different issues and 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 one of the people in the meeting stood up and said to him well here's what i think my jesus would never do that or say that, or think that. My Jesus wouldn't, you know, dot, 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 and then she made her points. My Jesus this, and my heaven this, and my Jesus that. And we talked about it and said, you know, do we all get to have our own Jesus? Right? I mean, do I have my own Jesus, and you have your own Jesus, and Jim has his own Jesus? And Taylor has her own Jesus. Do we all just get to do that? You know what? Our society basically says, of course you do. Of course you can have your own Jesus. We wouldn't want you to have to have somebody else's Jesus. Because you might not like their Jesus. So you can have your own. Isn't that great? Let's all hold hands and sing Kumbaya, right? (laughs) I mean, I mean, what more utopian society could there be? If we got to all create our own Jesus, right? I would say it's not utopian society, it's chaos. It's anarchy. Because we have to remember something. Questions about Jesus are not questions about personal opinion or thought. They are questions about historical facts, right? They're questions about historical facts. Who he was, what he said... We don't all get to just make up what we want to about Jesus. So I I want you to think about that before you judge Jesus. You've got to judge him based on what he said and what he did. So I've got four questions that I want all of us to, to wrestle with, okay, as we think about this. First question is this. Where does your information on Jesus and what Jesus said and did come from? Where does your information come from? That's a fabulous question, isn't it? I mean, it sounds so obvious, doesn't it? But I really want us to to wrestle with that. Because this person saying, well, my Jesus this, my Jesus that. where, where, Where do we get that? Where does it come from? Where does our information on Jesus and what Jesus did come from? You know, I remember when I was in in seminary listening to one of my professors talk about all the different, you know, modern ideas on Christianity and 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 Jesus. And of course, you know, that we talked about the the Jesus seminar, which was that group of scholars that gathered together and and decided to vote on which things of Jesus in the Bible were actually things Jesus said and and what Jesus really meant. And, And of course, their quest for the historical Jesus where that would lead them. And, and they, they made it sound like they had all this new information about things Jesus said and did. And I, I asked my professor, I said, um, has, is there some new recent discovery about Jesus and like a new book of the Bible that just came out or something? Or, or someone have like a recording in a cave somewhere? Or is there some new information that changes what the church has always taught and understood about Jesus for 2,000 years? Is, has that happened? Do the scholars today have additional information that, that the, the early church didn't possess? You want to know what the answer to that question is? No. 
No. There is no more information about Jesus today that wasn't available to the early church and the, 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 the fathers of our faith and the apostles. There's no new information. Anything that we bring to the table now comes from, from our own perspective. We don't have new records and new, new resources and things that would cause us to change. I mean, the world of science experiences that all the time. You know, we think, we think eggs are good for us. Then there's a study that comes out. No eggs are bad for us. And then there's another one that comes out. No eggs are good for us. Now you can eat chocolate and drink red wine and you'll be skinny. I read that on the Internet last week. Right? I mean, we're always changing what, based on new things. There's been nothing new that has come out about Jesus in 2,000 years. So you have to ask yourself then, where does our information come from? The answer is it, it comes from the Scriptures. It comes from the Scriptures. And I would add, it comes from the teaching of the church that, that, that gave birth to these Scriptures and, and, and has been teaching and passing down these, these traditions and these doctrines for 2,000 years. That's where the information comes from. So anybody that shows up with new information is, is not getting it from an old source. So you have to ask yourself, if, if your Jesus doesn't vibe with the, with the, with the, the Jesus of the Scripture, then, then, then where does your Jesus come from? Now, question number two. What happens to you personally when your opinion is different than what is taught about Jesus in the Bible? What do you do with that? Now, I'll be honest with you. That happens to me all the time. My opinions on things change all the time. And I may feel this way about that thing and this way. And then I'll read the scriptures and something will hit me and Jesus will just smack me right upside my face. You ever have that happen to you? You know, where you're just like, oh, Jesus, I, I, you want me to think this, believe this? Man, man, that's difficult. What do you do when that happens? Right? Because it should happen. What do you do when it does? That's a very important question. You know, really, there's only two choices or maybe three. You can ignore it. You can disobey it or you can submit your life to it. What do you do? What do you do? Number three, honest questions. Is it your goal to become more in line with Jesus' teaching based on Scripture? I mean, is that even really your goal? Is that what you're striving for? Are you digging into God's Word to find out? Is that what you're striving for in life? Or are you just kind of playing the church game, the religious societal thing, you know, where, where you come to church and do your thing and it's really not really, it's just part of your life but not the, the, the foundation of your life. I mean, that's a question that we all have to answer. And then number four, do you believe it's important for your life to be founded on the words and life of Jesus? You know, Mike gave this invitation last week and Jesus, of course, gave it to us in the end of John 6. He basically said, look, you can make a choice. You, you have to judge Jesus one way or the other. You have to decide what you're going to do with him. And, and, and do you want your life to be based on what he said and did or, or not? You can choose to either follow him or you can choose to unfollow him. But you can't change him. You can't do it. And Jesus makes room, obviously, for those who want to follow him. And he accepts the fact that there will be those who walk away. But what he doesn't give us room to do is create our own Jesus. It's not an option. It's not an option for us. Now, I know some people think, oh, that's incredibly exclusive. You know, who are you to say that Jesus, or who is Jesus to say, you know, that you've got to believe this or you've got to believe that? Answer is, he's Jesus. I, I like the way that, that Tim Keller puts it when he talks about this, of, this cultural objection that we have to the exclusive claims of Christianity, you know. He, he says that Christianity is, is at the same time completely exclusive while being completely inclusive, okay? And here's what Here's what he means by that. Christianity is exclusive in its truth claims and that Jesus stands up and says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. He doesn't say, just go wherever you want. He sets him, himself up as the only way. He said, you know, in, 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 in the scriptures, we'll read, to, we'll read them later. Where he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me, Jesus says. Incredibly exclusive. 
but at the same time, incredibly inclusive when he says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me. You know that anyone means anyone. Did you know that? That means that, there's, that whoever you are, wherever you come from, whatever your life, whatever your situation, however you find yourself, if you thirst, which is everyone, amen? He says, let anyone who is thirsty. I, I love that he says, let anyone. To me, that empowers me to make sure that no one's stopping anyone. Amen? Let no one be stopped from coming to Jesus. Let no one be stopped. He says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me. That's powerful stuff from the mouth of our Savior. You know, Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast aside. So whoever you are today, whatever you've been through, whatever you're going through, whatever has happened to you or whatever you've done, if you thirst and if you're honest with yourself, you do. Recognize your need for Jesus and recognize that all the religion in the world can't satisfy that thirst. All of the stuff of this world can't satisfy that thirst. All of the success can't satisfy you and all of the failure can't keep you away. Because Jesus says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me. Now, be warned. Be warned. Because when you come to Jesus... You come to Jesus, the real Jesus, not your own little personal Jesus that you create. You come to the real Jesus, and the real Jesus will give you that living water. He will not cast you aside. He will not reject you. He will not push you away. He will save your soul. He will die on a cross for you. He will rise from the dead for you. He will give his life for you and for anyone. But understand what it means to drink. It means that you do it on his terms. Make sure you understand that. Because, man, our society doesn't get that right now. We, we hear anyone can come to Jesus, and we want to come to Jesus, but Jesus, you better not tell me anything I don't want to hear, because I'll bail. Remember, he's incredibly exclusive while being unbelievably inclusive at the same time. That's our Jesus. We belong to Him. More so, we should say, we are His church. Because He's given His life to redeem us. Let anyone who is thirsty come to Him. If you're here and you're thirsty, if there's a need in your life, that, you know, there's no hor more horrible sensation that I've experienced than you know, being really, really, really thirsty. You know what I'm talking about. That's the kind of sensation our souls feel, feel in this world oftentimes. And Jesus says, come to me and I'll give you so much that it will overflow out of your life and spread everywhere. If you want that this morning, just come to him. Come to him on his terms and know this, he will accept you. Anyone who is thirsty, can come to Jesus. May that be true for you and for me this morning. Let's pray together, okay? And in your heart this morning, if you need to do that, then make this your moment with Jesus. Lord, now we all have that thirst within us that is unquenchable by the, the stuff of this world and the stuff of society, Lord. And, and Lord, we have all tried everything. But God, you alone know that the answer to humanity's thirst is found in you, Jesus. So, Lord, for those of us here today that are ready to say, we're thirsty, we come to you, God. Open your arms to us and receive us, Lord, into that living water. We turn from our sin. We turn from this world. We turn from our own opinions and feelings, God, and we place ourselves at the foot of the cross some of that water would flow onto us. That life-giving water of grace and mercy and truth that we might be counted among those who receive you and who call you Lord.
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Go ahead and take a look at this video. Okay. Well, I would say that you know, uh, Marian Methodist became special to me right when we came through the doors here. Um, after the service, everybody welcomed us so warmly and honestly. And immediately after we joined the church, um, it was amazing how quickly everybody or people would call us to join the activities, which we have been involved in many of the activities since then. You know, I just thought, and they were always so supportive of us, even you know, during good times and bad times, and it just, they just made it a very friendly place to be. Marion Methodist is just a very busy, busy church, and there's so many activities um, for everybody. I mean, from the youngest child to the oldest member of our church. Um, I mean. We strive to do so much for the community with um, Vacation Bible School and the missions, um, Fly, um, uh, Marian Cares. Just every there's it's just a very very busy busy church, and there's something for everybody. My name is Debbie Liscom, and these are the reasons I contribute to the First United Methodist Church. Will you please join me in worshiping in this manner? With the ushers, please come forward. <laughs>